Planning Board for Cape Elizabeth is now in session. Uh, first, on, first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from the previous meeting. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or corrections? Do I have a motion? I have a motion to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. The next item on the agenda is the uh, Munns versus Town of Cape Elizabeth, Berlin, DeLuca, Remand. The Planning Board will discuss at the dis direction of the Superior Court the application of Maggie Burlam and Noel DeLuca for a private road review to establish frontage for a lot located at 8 Astor Lane, section 19-7-9, private road review. To introduce uh, the item, we'll have John Waller, town attorney. Oh yeah, and uh, just before you go, yeah, I'd just like to mention for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, that since the last time this was before the uh, board, I became a resident of Cottage Brook, which is adjacent to the area where this property exists, about 300 yards, 400 yards away from the property from where Mr. Gilbert lives, which I don't believe is disqualifying, uh, but I'm happy to entertain comments. I also um, was not at the last meeting. Uh, but I have watched the uh, video of that meeting from beginning to end, and so I believe I'm up to speed on the matter, with the exception of the executive session of the last meeting, which I think was a repeat for new members of what Mr. Wall did for us before. So I mentioned that for the record. I believe I'm competent to continue in this case, but we'll entertain any concerns of the board. Are there any objection? No. I have no concerns. Okay, seeing none. Go ahead, John. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, as the uh, agenda item indicates, we're here for the consideration of the remand in the Astor Lane uh, private road matter. Um, as you will be aware, I provided the through the town planner a set of proposed or draft findings and conclusions for the board to consider in its discussion and, and vote this evening. Um, and uh, I also provided copies of that document to both the attorneys for the applicants as well as the attorney for the Munces. Um, uh, about four o'clock, a little after four o'clock today, I got uh, a couple of emails from uh, the Munces attorney indicating that it was their understanding from the wording of the agenda that the planning board was just going to be discussing this matter this evening, not necessarily taking a vote. And therefore her, her clients who are apparently out of state or will not be able to attend. Um, she sent me a couple emails, one of which also included some, some uh, points of contention that uh, she had with regard to some of the proposed findings and conclusions. Um, I wanted to make the board aware of this. Um, they have not, the, the months is through their, their attorney, have not asked specifically for a continuance of this matter. Um, and I believe that uh, the, the vote from the last meeting was reasonably clear that the matter would be taken up for um, discussion of proposed findings and conclusions and a vote. Um, but I did want to make you aware of this. Um, I do have copies of the emails I received from the Munz's attorney um, that you may wish to look at in terms of the, the points she raised this afternoon. Um, and uh, to take any questions you may have in terms of uh, whether or not to proceed today. Uh, let me just ask you one really quick question. Is there any um, responsibility on the part of the board to announce at a meeting that they will or will not take a vote at the next meeting? Um, well, I, I would say generally speaking, not consideration of a matter typically um, it usually includes, unless it's specifically said it's just, for example, for uh, just looking at completeness or something like that, it's usually a, a vote is, is one of the matters that's under consideration in any kind of, of issue. So I think it's implicit when you have an, uh, a matter like this that it would be included. Uh, in this particular case, uh, obviously the vote that was taken last week was, I thought, relatively clear that you know, a vote was included in what was going to happen tonight. So. Okay. Um, 
Does anybody else have a quick question for John before we move to the public hearing? Uh, I didn't know if there was some quick digest you could give us based on the, the emails that you got from that, if there was anything new that we could learn from them, or do we actually need to read them? I mean, um, Well, I, I don't want to try and put a gloss on what they're saying here. Um, uh, basically, the, the one specific item that uh, uh, Attorney McGee mentions, um, and I'll just read from her, her email. Uh, I, do not, I do want to observe, however, that the statements in your draft findings and conclusions regarding the gate are, in my view, inconsistent with the statements made by several board members at the last meeting that they had no jurisdiction over or opinion as to the presence or absence of the gate. There are some additional comments in the email regarding to, uh, some matters that are currently pending in a private lawsuit, but I, I don't think that's particularly germane to what the, the board's doing here. That's the only substantive thing that's mentioned in her emails. That, that's good, thanks. Pete. Uh, John, do you think that if we make a decision tonight one way or the other, that, that would be subject to challenge for improper notice? And if so, is there anything to be lost by simply postponing to the next meeting? Um, I'm gonna answer your question two ways. One, I think proper notice was given based upon the vote from the last meeting. And I think even though um, the uh, agenda item could have mentioned vote, I, I think it was implicit in what was going on, particularly in, with regard to what happened to the last meeting. Um, is it possible that challenge may nonetheless be raised with regard to um, uh, adequate notice? I suppose it's possible, but I, I do think that enough was done to afford notice that it would hold up. Um, just, uh, is there any information that they gave us with regards to new information that they found with regards to the private access way being recorded? There's nothing in the emails concerning that. Okay, and um, if you don't mind, after you're done talking, I was hoping just to see those emails and maybe I could circulate around the board. So Absolutely. there's no indication that we didn't see the information that was given. And um, on the final note that Peter, I think that there was absolutely uh, uh, adequate notice given to all the parties that we were gonna be discussing this and that most likely there was gonna be findings that the town attorney were gonna prepare for us. And what do we do when we have findings? Uh, we usually discuss them and take information from the public and have a vote. So I think that there is adequate notice that was given to all the parties. Okay. Um, we will now open the public hearing. Um, Unlike uh, the last meeting, we're gonna strictly hold to the three minute limit. Um, so please, you can uh, stand up, introduce yourself. Hi, good evening everyone. Scott Anderson here for Maggie Burlam and Noel DeLuca, the applicants. Um, just very briefly, I, I agree with some of the comments that have been made by board members that we all knew when we left the last meeting that uh, John was going to draft proposed findings and, a, and that a, a decision was going to be made. I think everybody had um, a, a, a full opportunity to kind of exercise their due process rights at the last meeting and present information to the board. And so um, it's true, people can always raise process arguments, but I have no doubt that the board uh, permitted the, everyone in this proceeding to make comments um, and provide whatever information they thought was relevant. So we're uh, hopeful that you're able to make a decision this evening because we think it's ready to go. Also, the, the uh, objections raised about the, the, the discussion of the gate, we think, are, 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 are really not valid. As you probably remember, when we set this up at the last meeting, because of what the court did, the board was required to kind of reissue the full opinion, which is why John's findings go in to a lot of those matters that you had found previously um, in the applicant's favor. But because the court vacated the prior order, Order, you have to go through the process of reissuing a full um, order and all of those references to the gate, the comments by the fire chief and the police, um, the fact that it's an orphan gate, um, that was all part of the original order that the board had done. Um, 
it is the case at the last meeting when you were trying to figure out this private access way, everybody agreed the gate wasn't an issue, but in order to have a, a complete um, order that reflects everything you did before, plus um, what you did with regard to the private access way, we think that the draft findings that John has pulled together are appropriate and um, complete and thorough and accurate and uh, are appropriate for you to act on. So we're here for any questions, but other than that, in far less than two minutes, I'll step down. Thanks. Great, thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to come forward and speak? Okay, seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Um, does anyone on the board have questions or comments? Good. Good morning. I mean, to be just really bureaucratic about this, I just want to be clear that what you just did was not officially a public hearing, but a comment, public comment period, okay. which is required by the planning board rules. It was not advertised as a public hearing, but um, you are required under your rules to allow an opportunity for public comment at every meeting. Okay, thank you. Jonathan? Um, to, for the record, I've read the emails that were provided to us by Attorney Wall. Um, there's nothing in there that I can see as anything new with regards to information that was requested last time about whether or not the valid, it was a valid private access way. Um, there is an indication as Attorney Wall represented about the gate, which to me is a issue that's already been um, litigated. Um, exhaustively, and to put it mildly, and uh, so I don't think that there's anything new. Uh, I would just ask that those two emails submissions be entered into the record, um, so there's an indication that we saw that information as uh, part of this discussion, and uh, I think I'm ready to move forward. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments? I'll just give one. I, I just wanted to um, support the fact that it seems like there was more than adequate notice going forward today. It definitely follows our normal process, and it seemed like it was very clear we were going to get finding proposed to us by our attorney and that we would make a decision. So I, I don't know how they would have found otherwise. And just one thing further on Andrew's point is that when the materials came out along with the agenda, um, not only was this item on the agenda and the language uh, written by staff, but also there was a memorandum uh, that said that uh, with regards to this remand that there was going to be draft findings of fact and motion for the planning board to consider. Uh, will be prepared by town attorney John Wall and provided to planning board prior to the meeting, which is exactly what has happened here. Okay, well, Pete, uh, Joe, and last but probably least on the point is that the notice as it's written refers to us uh, acting at the direction of the Superior Court on the application. So what the Superior Court instructed us to do is really what we're uh, doing right now, which could be nothing or you know changing our, our uh, determinations, which I believe is what we have some language to do. So I, I, I uh, to me, it's it's adequate, and the um, the the falling back of the in these emails upon the issue of the gate, I find no substantive reason uh, to change our view on that. All right. Well, great. It sounds like we have a consensus to proceed. Um, I assume everyone's read through the draft findings and conclusions. Does anyone have any comments or issues with any of the findings or conclusions? I don't have any issues with any of the findings. I do have four typos. Yeah, you're a bunch of typos. I just, that proves to you I read it. I read it <laughs> in detail. So uh, okay. when we get to that point, I'll let you. But I, I thought the findings uh, reiterated our, our discussion, and I thought it reiterated our original findings when we voted back in May. So uh, I did not find anything substantive to change in here. Anyone else? Would someone like to make um, a motion? Yeah, I got a, I got a motion for draft findings and conclusions. You, you want the typos? Yes. I, obviously, you have a keener eye than I do. 
uh, under finding number 10, the property that is the subject of Mr. It should be Ms. It's on page two. Wait, and the and number where 11. Where on number 10? The first sentence. Right up, the subject of, it should be Ms. Burlam, not Mr. Burlam. Same with, same with number 11, same, same one. They got it right every place else. On uh, finding number 25, um, the proposed private road will make the applicant's lot a buildable something. So I added the word property by providing necessary front frontage. And then on page. Could also just eliminate the word uh. Yeah, you just eliminated uh, the word of. Uh. On 26, eliminate yeah. what, the word uh. Um, instead of adding the word property. Now I'm on number 25. Right. Could read applicant's lot billable by providing necessary properties. Yeah. Either way, they, it, the 25 and 26 were essentially had the same verbiage, and so go whichever way you want. Right. On page 12, under at the top of the page, that first sentence approves the application of Margaret Burlam for review. I took out the word review and changed it to approves the application of Margaret Berlin for an 80 foot long private road extension. That's it. Okay. Everybody prepared? Okay. <laughs> Take breath. John, John wants to say something else. Yes. Oh. I just want to say this is 13 pages long. <laughs> so be ready. First, I want to apologize to Ms. Farrell because that was my fault on the Mr. and Mrs. Ms. Um, there was one other typo I noticed, and that is on page 8, paragraph 64. Um, it should be met, not me, in that sentence. Okay. All right. Um, Motion for the uh, board for draft findings and, con or, or excuse me, findings and conclusions. Um, number one, Margaret Berlin has applied for an 80 foot private road extension off the public portion of Astor Lane to create the road frontage and access necessary to obtain a building permit with regard to a parcel of land identified as eight Astor Lane and depicted as a lot, as lot 42 on Cape Elizabeth zoning map U49. Number two, under the town's ordinance, the planning board's review, uh, the planning board reviews Ms. Berlin's application under section 19-7-9 and ap applicable standards for a local road as set forth in chapter 16, subdivision regulations subject to the board's authority to grant waivers. Number three, the planning board deemed Ms. Berlin's application complete on April 23rd, 2018 and held a site walk on April 30th, 2018. Number four, the planning board addressed the merits of Ms. Berlin's application at a hearing on May 15, 2018, and after consider, considering all the evidence presented, voted to approve the application with considerations. Number five, Christopher and Julie Munns took an appeal of the board, planning board's decision to Superior Court pursuant to Main Rule Civil Procedure 80B. Number six, on March 12, 2019, the Cumberland County Superior Court issued a decision and order affirming most of the board's decisions, but also remanding the case to the planning board to make the findings and conclusions with regards to the following, quote, to determine whether the private access way claimed by the Munzes is valid, and if so, whether the private access way and maintenance agreement should be considered under the application, end quote. Number seven, on July 3rd, 2019, the Cumberland County Superior Court issued an order of clarification that vacated the planning board's May 15th decision and remanded the case to the planning board to make findings and conclusions 
referenced above and to enter a decision on the application in light of those additional findings and conclusions. Number eight, and expressly, as expressly authorized by the Superior Court's July 3rd, 2019 order, the Planning Board conducted a hearing on September 17, 2019 to address the Superior Court's remand order and to receive any evidence on the issues identified in the remand order and any other issues pertinent to the application. Number nine, after the discussion by the Board at the close of the public portion of the hearing, the Board voted to table this matter and authorize the Town Attorney to prepare draft findings and conclusions based on the Board's discussions about this application and the evidence presented relevant to the application for the board to adopt, reject, modify, or augment as the board sets fit, or excuse me, sees fit. Number 10, um, with regards to the approval standards for new private roads. Uh, number 10, the, the property that is subject of Miss Berlin's application is owned by Miss Berlin and Noel DeLuca, C. DeLuca, uh, pursuant to a quick claim deed dated October 24, 2017, and recorded with the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds at Book 34414 and page 113. Number 11, the property that is subject of Miss Berlin's application was recognized as a joinder of two lots pursuant to a corrective, corrective and confirmatory release deed dated to Miss Berlin's and Noel C. DeLuca's dated December 15, 2017 and recorded with the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds at book 34544 and page 304. Uh, conclusion. Number 12, based on the find, above findings, Ms. Berlin has demonstrated sufficient right title and interest to construct a private road for access to and frontage for the property at map U49, lot 42. Number 13, the proposed construction of an 80-foot private road off the end of the public portion of Astor Lane is not located in a floodplain and the applicant is not proposing any subsurface water, excuse me, waste disposal as part of the construction. Number 14, the applicant has incorporated the slope of the land into her stormwater management plan and no direct discharge into a stream is proposed. Number 15, the proposed construction is not expected to generate undue water pollution. Um, Number 16, based upon the above findings, the court, or excuse me, the board concludes that the proposed project meets the pollution standard. Um, number 17, the applicant has submitted a letter from the Portland Water District that indicates that the lot uh, that would receive its necessary frontage and access through the proposed private road extension can be served by public water. Uh, number 18, based on the above finding, the board concludes that the proposed project meets the potable water standard. Uh, number 19, the applicant has submitted plans that include an erosion control plan which identifies placement of silt fencing and insta installation of check dams to slow stormwater from the road following construction. Number 20, based upon the above finding, the court concludes that the proposed project meets the erosion standard. That would be the board. The board. Did, did I say the court again? Yeah, yeah. The board, sorry. Not a judge. Uh, number 21, the applicant submitted the applicant submitted a traffic study in support of her application performed by Traffic Solution. Number 22, the traffic study indicates that the applicant's proposal to remove a chain gate and construct a private road extending 80 feet off the end of the public portion of Astor Lane will likely have a minimal impact on the volume of traffic on South Street. Number 23, the applicant has submitted a road maintenance agreement that provides for the maintenance of the proposed private road to allow for access by public safety vehicles. Number 24, the proposed private road will improve an existing gravel area to to private road standards subject to certain requested waivers which is desirable under the town's comprehensive plan number 25 the proposed private road will make the applicants lot a buildable property by providing necessary frontage and by providing an access route number 26 the proposed private road will make the applicants lot a buildable property in an area with with other adjacent homes, which is desirable under the town's comprehensive plan. Number 27, the proposed private road will connect to a public road ex accepted by the town and constructed to provide access to an improved subdivision. Number 28, according to the town fire chief, the proposed private road with the chain gate removed will provide enhanced access for emergency vehicles. Number 29, the proposed private road with the chain gate removed will eliminate an impediment to access to a development or neighborhood. Number 30, according to the town fire chief, gates slow the emergency vehicles down. Number 31, the chain gate 
Uh, the applicant proposes to remove is a quote, orphan gate, end quote, meaning it is not sanctioned by the town. There is no evidence of a plan submitted to the town that shows the gate or provides a justification for the gate under the town's ordinance. Number 32, according to the survey submitted, the existing gate is in the public right of way and not on, cell uh, not on the cell street right of way. Number 33, section 19-7-16, which pertains to creation of a shortcut via a developed residential street is not applicable because a shortcut between two separate points of an arterial collector, rural connector, or feeder street will not be created. Number 34, as indicated by the traffic study, the low volumes of vehicular traffic anticipated on the proposed road are not expected to create a safety hazard. Number 35, given the existing gravel in the area of South Street, there is little opportunity to vary the location of the proposed road. Number 36, the applicant has a Ask the board to waive the minimum requirements for road width, position in the right of way, um, for example, centering, uh, shoulder, and underground enclosed a drainage system. Number 37, the applicants seek a waiver of the 22 foot minimum road width requirement so that the private road would flow seamlessly into the existing graveled portion of South Street. Number 38, according to the applicant's plans, a private road would taper from a width of 22 feet where it connects to the public portion of Astor Lane to a width of 18 feet where it connects with South Street. Number 39, similarly, the applicants, applicants seek a waiver of the standard that a road be centered within a right of way to account for the fact that cell street is not centered number 40 according to the applicant's plans a private road would be centered where it connects to the public portion of Astor Lane and veer slightly to the east to match up with the center of South Street. Number 41, the applicant has requested a waiver of the shoulder width standard to match South Street, which has no shoulders. Number 42, by keeping with the existing constructed shoulder widths, there would be no there would not, excuse me, there would not be any additional impacts to the culverts and ditch on the left side of the street. Number 43, the applicant is seeking a waiver of the enclosed drainage system requirements. Number 44, the proposed waiver of the enclosed drainage system requirements will make a private road consistent with South Street and minimize disruption of existing improvements. Number 45, overall the applicant's request for waivers of certain road construction standards are designed to integrate the private road with the existing gravel portion of South Street. Number 46, as indicated by the town engineer, the requested waivers do not adversely affect the functionality of this low speed and low volume roadway. Uh, conclusions. The number 47, the subdivision ordinance authorized the board to grant the requested waivers when practical difficulties would arise from strict compliance with the standards. Subdivision ordinance section 16-3-5. Number 48, based on the findings above, the applicant has demonstrated that the waivers she has requested for road width position in the right of way, running center, centering, shoulder, and underground enclosed drainage systems are justified as practical difficulties as practical difficulties would arise from the strict compliance with the standards. Number 49, based upon the findings above, the applicant has demonstrated that the proposed private road is designed so it will provide safe vehicular and pedestrian travel and traffic patterns. Uh, number 50, consistent with the letter from the town sewer superintendent, the applicant's proposal to connect the public sewer system will be permitted. Um, number 51, based upon the findings above, the applicant has met the sewer disposal requirements. Number 52, the site of the proposed private road is not located in a vista or view corridor. Uh, number 53, there is no indication that the site of the proposed private road affects any significant wildlife habitats. And number 54, the proposed road construction will occur almost entirely in an existing gravel area. Number 55, the site of the proposed private road does not implicate any farmland. Number 56, based upon the above findings, the applicant's proposal satisfies the requirements pertaining to aesthetic, cultural, and natural values. Number 57, the proposed road construction is consistent with the comprehensive plan, particularly to the extent the proposal will promote street connectivity. Number 58, two non-conforming lots have been merged to create one lot that exceeds the current, minima, uh, current minimum lot size of 20,000 square feet. Number 59, there is no evidence in the record to suggest that the proposed road construction does not conform to the town's ordinance, ordinances. 
Uh, number 60, based upon the above findings, the proposed road construction conforms to the town ordinances. Number 61, as indicated by the communica communication from the town manager, the applicant has adequate financial and technical ability to complete the proposed project. Number 62, based upon the above finding, the applicant has demonstrated adequate financial and technical ability to complete the proposed project. Uh, number 63, the proposed road construction does not involve any significant aqu aquifer recharge area. Uh, number 64, based upon the above finding, the applicant has met the groundwater requirement. Number 65, the proposed project is not located in the floodplain. Number 66, based upon the above finding, the applicant has met the flo flood areas. Uh, requirement number 67 the proposed project does not involve the alteration of wetland any wetlands number 68 based upon the above finding the applicant has met the white wetlands requirement number 69 the applicants revised construction plans reflect provisions for stormwater management including measures to protect the downslope areas and riprap protection of the edges of the of the road where stormwater was discharging at the end of the curb along Astor Lane. Number 70, the town engineer is recommending replacement of a section of silt fence or hay bales with additional check dams. Number 71, the applicant's revised construction plans reflect that all but two feet of an existing paved burn would be retained and that removal of that portion will cause gutter, cause gutter drainage to flow off the pavement to newly to new easterly ditch. Uh, number 72, the, the features reflected on the revised construction plans will act to uh, accentuate stormwater uh, runoff velocities, which will protect against erosion and mitigate the drainage generated from the roadway improvements. Number 73, the uh, retention of the existing paved burn at the end of the paved section of Astor Lane and the additional riprap protection in its receiving ditch will help to protect against the gravel areas beyond the end of the paved section of Astor Lane from being washed out during intense rainfall events. Number 74, the applicant's proposed project will result in a minimal net gain of impervious area. Number 75, based upon the above findings, the board concludes that no formal stormwater management report is necessary. Based upon the above findings, the applicant has demonstrated that the project will provide adequate stormwater management. Number 77, the proposed project is not within the, in the watershed of, um, I should say, of Great Pond. No, it's A. Of A Great Pond, excuse me. Um, Number 78, based upon uh, the above findings, the applicant has met the wetlands requirement. Number 79, the applicant has made provisions for the underground installation of utilities, including water, electric, telephone, and cable TV. Number 80, based upon the above findings, the applicant has met the utility access requirement. Number 81, the following standards were inapplicable, or excuse me, are inapplicable to the applicant's proposal, solid waste disposal, surface waters, impact on adjoining municipality, land subject to liquidation, harvesting, access to direct sunlight, open space impact fee, and phasing. Uh, number 82, based on all the foregoing findings and conclusions, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the private road review zoning ordinance section 19-7-9 and subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1. Number 83, Christopher and Julie Munns, as owners of 5 South Street, are successors in interest of Philip and Darnell Nedwell, Dar, excuse me, Darlene Nedwell. Number 84, by an, approve, an approval issued on March 16, 2004, and confirmed by a letter dated March 17, 2004, the Planning Board granted a request by the Nedwells to create a private access way on South Street to make 5 South Street a buildable lot. Number 85, pursuant to the express terms of the approval granted to the Nedwells, the Nedwells were required to record the approval with the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds within 90 days, which the approval identified as June 14, 2004. Number 86, pursuant to the express terms of the approval granted to the Nedwells, the approval, uh, quote, will be null and void, end quote, if not recorded within 90 days. Number 87, the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds has no record of a, quote, private access plan, end quote, pertaining to the approval granted to the Nedwells. Number 88, the Munzes have not presented any evidence that the approval for the private access way granted to the Nedwells was ever recorded with the Registry of Deeds. Number 89, the approval 
for the private access way granted to Ned Wells was not recorded within 90 days of the approval. Number 90, pursuant to the terms of the private access way approval granted to the Ned Wells and the, and the pertinent provisions of the town, town zoning ordinance section 19-7-9D5B, the approval was null and void as of June 15, 2004 due to the failure to record the approval within 90 days of the approval being granted. Number 91, the building permit granted to the Nedwells in December of 2004 by the town CEO does not assist the board in resolving the issues on remand because one, the building permit was issued more than six months after the approval to the Nedwells was rendered null and void, and two, there is no evidence in the record that the CEO specifically determined that the approval was, proper, was properly and timely recorded. Number 92, the comments by the town CEO in 2013 and 2018 do not assist the board in resolving the issues on remand because one, the comments were made several years after the approval to the Ned Nedwells was rendered null and void, and two, there is no evidence in the record that the CEO has had, excuse me, specifically determined that the approval was properly and timely recorded when he made the comments. Number 93, for the purposes of this application to satisfy the terms of the Superior Court's remand order, the board finds that the assert, asserted private access affiliated, uh, excuse me, private access way affiliated with 5 Cell Street is not valid. Number 94, although not strictly within the scope of the remand order, the board would note that the proposed private road will have the incidental effect of providing necessary frontage to make 5, Street, 5 Cell Street a buildable lot. Number 95, even if a portion of Cell Street were a valid private access way, the private road would affect an improvement or upgrade over a length of that access way that is entirely consistent with the town zoning ordinance. Number 96, the criteria for the creation of a private road does not require the board to resolve issues pertaining to alleged overlapping road maintenance agreements. Uh, therefore, be it ordered that based on the foregoing findings of, and conclusions, the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the board approves the application of Margaret Berlin for an 80 foot long private access, excuse me, private road extension from Astor Lane and Public Road to create road frontage for a lot located at 8 Astor Lane subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address paragraph number six in the town engineer's letter dated May 9th, 2018. Number two, that a road maintenance agreement be provided for the 80 foot private section of Astor Lane in the form acceptable to the town attorney and the town manager signed by the applicant and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Number three, that the approval, the approval includes waivers from the road width or from the road width shoulder with center lane and enclosed stormwater requirements consistent with the requirements of section 16-3-5 waivers. Number four, that a MUTCD compliant uh, sign or compliant sign uh, or otherwise as approved by the public works director be installed by the applicant in the right of way on Stevenson Street at the intersection of Stevenson Street and Hamlin Street and in the right of way of Astor Lane slash South Street at the beginning of the private portion of Astor Lane that states, quote, private, um, uh, private road access for Steven Street, the Stevenson Street and South Street residents only, end quote. Number five, that a note be added to the plan that there shall be no road construction under a performance guarantee, uh, excuse me, until a performance guarantee has been approved to the town in accordance with section 16-2-6 of the subdivision ordinance. Number six, that the following note replace number one on sheet C-100. Uh, activities outside the building envelope are restricted to the installation of a driveway and installation of utilities. The extent of uh, the extent of driveway and utility installation within the buffer be shown on the plans be the minimal amount of disturbance and also limited to more than uh, to no more than 1,300 square feet of disturbed area within the buffer. No structure shall be constructed within 10 feet of the edge of the building envelope. No vegetation removal other than uh, for the above activities is allowed except at follows. Hazard, dead or storm, storm damage, 
trees in areas outside the building envelope may be removed after consultation with the code enforcement officer in compliance with the following conditions. The removal of standing dead trees resulting from natural causes or storm damaged trees is permissible without the need for replanting as long as the removal does not result in the creation of new lawn areas or other permanently cleared areas and stumps are not removed. The area shall be required to naturally revegetate and or be planted with native plants within one year if natural vegetation has not been established. For the purposes of this provision, dead trees are those trees that contain no foliage during the growing season. Number seven, that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to the recording uh, to recording the plan number 8 there shall be no disturbance of the site nor issuance of a building permit until the plan has been signed by the planning board and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds second uh, actually i have one correction perhaps i think on number 72 page 9 you said uh, features reflected on the revised construction plans will act to i think you said essentially Accentuate? Attenuate? Yeah, I think you actually meant, well, you said, I think you said accentuate. Accentuate? I don't know. Anyway, I, if I didn't say attenuate, that would attenuate. It sounded like, yeah. It, yeah. Because it, it's written properly. It's written properly, yeah. Okay. I think you, when you, and if, I think if you said accentuate, it might actually make it sound worse than it is rather than attenuate. Yeah, I don't think I said, I thought I said attenuate, but. I have, uh, I think it's an error on 55. I think that meant to be the site of the proposed private road does not impact any farmland, not implicate. What was your friendly amendment? 55. Impact. Did not implant. Where it says implicate, I yeah. think, so John, would you agree with that? No, uh, this John. Yeah, so I, w I would agree to a friendly amendment on number 55. The, uh, the site of the proposed private road does not impact any farmland. I agree with that. Okay. Any others? All right, I have a question that's somewhat annoying because I have to mention the gate. Um, number 22, the traffic study indicates that the applicant's proposal to remove a chain gate and construct a private road. The last time I looked through those drawings, I didn't actually see anything in the site plan that said the gate is to be removed. It's simply shown on the survey. Am I incorrect on that? And does it matter? I'm going to wait for John to, I'm, I'm looking at Scott Anderson representing the applicants and I believe he was pretty clear that the applicants were asserting their rights to connect to South, to Astor Lane, which no, would require that. the removal of the gate. So I believe the, the applicants said they would remove the, what we call a gate, which is a chain and post. But the planning board didn't authorize it or not authorize it. But well, number 22 does not say that the planning board authorized it. It okay. says that the applicants proposed to remove it and that the traffic study recognized that. And, and given the fact that the Superior Court ordered us to go back and basically start from scratch, I think that that would be a proper finding to have in there because we basically that was when the applicant came to us back in 2018. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that, and then ultimately it turned out that the chief of police at that time um, took the gate away because there was no authorization, but I, I think it would be proper to have that in there um, just to kind of seal that up uh, since the court is ordering us to go back and start from scratch. Okay. And also, you may recollect that um, we discovered that that gate was not actually on South Street. It was in the public right. road, Astor Lane. So its removal was predestined when it was found to be in Astor Lane. I think, John. Uh, you can follow up with, with Scott if you think it's necessary. But um, that, 
that paragraph was um, something that was mentioned by the board previously and actually one of its prior findings mentioned by the court in terms of the, the conclusions of the traffic study. And the traffic study is premised on the idea that the proposal would be to remove the, the existing gate as part of the construction of the private road. In fact, the very last paragraph talks about, of the traffic study talks about if you remove, if you move that gate and create this private road, what impact will it have? So I think it was designed to encapsulate all of those uh, ideas that had been previously discussed. Okay. Anything else? All right, all in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, thank you guys. All right, the next the next item on the agenda is the Cunner Lane Private Road Review. David Smith is requesting a private road review for a portion of Cunner Lane to relocate a turnaround located on the southwest side of 19 Cunner Lane under section 1979, private access way and private road review, public hearing. Um,
Okay, go ahead, Bob. Good evening, I'm Bob McCaffrey with Metron Associates, uh, representing David Smith on this application for the private road. And with me this evening is Alan Atkins, uh, Mr. Smith's attorney. Uh, basically, since the uh, last time we were before the board and uh, we had the site walk to go over the private access road uh, and the uh, conditions are out on the site. Uh, the one thing that we had uh, discussed at the last meeting and question regarding survey of the property. This is a partial survey uh, that was completed by Owen Haskell, uh, showing the property and the boundary lines along the existing portions of Connor Lane. And uh, this hatched area in here is that area that we uh, reviewed during the site walk, which is the area of prescriptive rights for the abutters along uh, Connor Lane. That portion of Connor Lane actually is constructed on Mr. Smith's property. So that was the, the question that had been raised at the last meeting, and that's what we reviewed during the, uh, the site, site walk. We've modified the site, updated the site plan to reflect that change. And so the portion you see highlighted in yellow is that area of prescriptive easement along the portions of what is paved now is Connell Lane and used by all parties out there. The right of way for Connell Lane, the property line for the Smith property runs right along here. Uh, we had looked at that with some of the, uh, the PK nails and the pins that were set up on the roadway so we were able to see where that property line exists. So the actual right of way, which the yellow doesn't quite highlight enough, that's the property line for this lot here, the outer edge of the right of way is this portion along here, ties back in around as part of the turnaround. And then that's the easement area over the existing driveway that uh, creates the area for the right of way and the turnaround uh, required by the fire department. Uh, Mr. Harding had issued a number of uh, comments that we responded to. One of those was to address the grading along the uh, pull out area for the fire department access to the fire cisterns. Uh, those were changed and there were a couple of details he asked us to modify and those were addressed as well. And the other one was the uh, waiver we hadn't requested was for an enclosed drainage system and we did submit that with the last submission. Uh, and uh, given the fact that everything was already constructed out on site, there was no negligible uh, increase in any stormwater runoff from the uh, proposed improvements there. Um, that's pretty much the changes that uh, we've had since then. Uh, there was one comment in terms of that I noted on your report uh, that the, it indicated it was 25,000 gallon cistern and it's actually two 5,000 gallon or a total of 10,000 gallons uh, of uh, fire, store, fire suppression storage uh, for those two tanks. So that's in a nutshell the, the changes that we did from the, uh, the last submission and the site walk. Happy to answer any okay. questions. You're done? All set. Okay, great. Next item is the uh, public hearing. Um, the uh, meeting is now open to the public hearing. Is there any member of the public who wishes to come forth and speak? Okay, seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Uh, so let's open it up to the board for discussion. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Bob? So I'm not sure, Bob, if you got this letter that we just received from uh, attorney for the people on uh, Cutter Lane. Did you receive this? Okay. I actually went to Mr. Atkins and we went over through that. Okay. Can you just tell us a little bit about some of the concerns that they had and whether or not they're being addressed? I believe they're being addressed. I'm going to probably have Alan from the legal standpoint answering that. The concern was with where the right of way is for Cutter Lane and basically it falls within uh, Mr. Smith's property. As we said, that is his property line out 
within the confines of what is paved as Cunnel Lane. So the road extension right of way for the private road basically extends from that front lot line back in. The only improvements that were really necessitated for the private road really was to encompass this portion of the driveway. But because this was the road frontage, legal frontage, I mean, the uh, his property line, if we move the right of way in behind the fence, then it becomes landlocked and doesn't really achieve the right of way uh, as a full extension of his property. So that's why the right of way comes all the way out into uh, what is the paved portion of Connor Lane itself right now. Okay. Um, it's just speaking for myself, I mean, on the other side of the gate, I think that what the applicant is requesting makes sense. Um, my concern is for what's on the other side of the gate. Uh, there was a concern that was mentioned in this letter, and maybe this is for Attorney Atkins um, rather than you, but that uh, there's concern by, by counsel for the neighbors, and I'm not saying that the applicant's going to do this, but that there had been um, sort of veiled threats about putting his stone wall um, on the other side of the, or putting it and blocking that portion of the road that's on his property. I'd imagine that there's something already in place um, that would not, that would not allow him to do that from easements that are allowed on that road, but I'm just hoping that that could be mentioned here uh, to alleviate some of those concerns of the neighbors. I'm gonna to defer to Mr. Atkins to, to respond to that. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Uh, all of the improvements are on Mr. Smith's land. The uh, private road extends from the gate heading eastward to the ocean. The, there is no impairment of anyone's rights to use anything between the gate and the traveled way. Uh, Mr. McDonald in his letter talks specifically, uh, quoting to his, uh, that he has no problem with the application, he just wants to make sure that the gate is where it is and that the private road access does not interfere with that, and that's the case. Mr. Smith uh, has no plans to move the wall, he hasn't moved the wall, any comments made about the wall were several years ago in the heat of litigation. The wall is entirely on his land. He has no plans of moving it at the present time. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Right. I have two, quest two questions. Um, one, I guess, a follow-up to that maybe for Maureen is that um, in any sort of site approval context, does the basically layout of this wall on that private land, does the planning board have any, would there need to be a, a site plan amendment if that was to be moved or that road, the existing road surface to be moved as it now stands on this plan? In other words, would it come back to us if he was to try and move the wall? Or the road? Well, we're, we're kind of speculating about what would happen, but I can certainly imagine situations where things would happen that would not look like what you're approving right now, and the town may want to pull it back in for an amendment because it doesn't look like the way it looks now. At the same time, we're talking private roads, private property owners, and if the town's interests are preserved, the, the ability of the fire chief to get in and out of this property, there may be things that get altered that the board does not want to get in the middle of. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, the second question was, I'm still struggling, sorry, I'm still struggling a little bit with the, the private road as it's uh, been designed. Um, it's narrow, I mean, I know the base, you know, we have evidence in here the base was was made to road, private road standards. There was one remark in the responses on page three. Uh, there was a question, or was it, sorry, um, number 11. Um, it was, the question was again, or the comment actually was, again, the fire chief should be consulted as to his approval of the grass surface over the gravel, given the dif difficulty in maintaining such a surface, especially especially during the winter and spring seasons. And it says this detail has been revised accordingly. I assume that meant relative to the first part of that uh, comment of 11 about the probably loam over the three inch layer. Um, 
I know the fire chief came down there. I, I can't remember, I couldn't find the email. Does he specifically address travel over the grass shoulder, I guess, and that that was adequate in that email? Can you remind me? Yes. yes. We, did okay. that. we have the chief here. You, are you interested in answering that? No, about the shoulder itself. I mean, it it looks wide and whatnot. My, my worry is that if a vehicle gets stuck in the middle of the road, not in the, not in the turnouts on either turnout, but say between the turnout and the driveway, that's only 14 feet with the grass shoulders. Are you gonna be able to get a car, another vehicle around it? Say so it can't be removed for whatever reason. That's my concern. I mean, 22 feet is the standard for a private road. We're now at 14 feet, but really 10 feet plus two feet on either side. So, you know, I'm honestly a little hesitant to approve something that's now eight feet off of what the standard is. And when everything is, there, there actually is one case of an eight foot um, difference as Maureen has laid out here in her list. So I'm just trying to make sure that you guys are comfortable with the setup. Uh, uh, over the entire length, all the way to the turnaround and back. I'm comfortable with it. We met. What it's designed to do is to, for the first truck to pull off, and so we can use that mm -hmm. those cisterns. And the second truck, if there's adequate distance between that and the second, so the second truck can pass. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the the issue that I'm seeing is not um, is if some vehicle got stuck. Not like you were, you know, you're talking about planning to pull off and then pull pull trucks around, but what if a truck was in the middle of the road between the two, you know, in a normal road situation, you have enough travel. I mean, how, how wide is a fire engine? 102 inches. So, what is that, Not nine feet? Um, so that would take up most of that. You couldn't pass another fire truck around that. No. So that, that's my point. 22 feet, you could, right? Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm willing to side with whatever the board wants, but I'm just bringing up this concern now so that um, it's uh, considered. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, yep. John? I, I can understand Andrew's concern, but at the same time, I think if, if something gets, if a fire truck gets stuck in the middle of a lot of roads, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble because of that. And we can't ask people for private access roads and people who have long driveways to extend with the idea that, yeah, what would happen if something large got stuck in the middle of it and would you be able to get around it? Um, so getting out there, seeing that site plan, seeing how wide it is, or I think that they're, I, I'm okay with the proposal um, and hearing from the fire chief that he's okay with it too. Uh, I don't really want to go on this on the idea that we have to make approval for something catastrophic like something getting stuck in the middle of the road and getting something around it. But that's just me. Well, I mean, the one difference is we're talking private road versus an access way, right? So there is another house at the end. So I mean, what we always have to consider is the other guy, right? So um, you know, we're proving for more than one resident. So that that's my concern always. But if if he's happy with it, then 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 that's fine. Okay, so just to reiterate, you, you've gone out, you've checked the site, you're fine with it as designed? It's adequate. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, would someone like to make a motion? Findings of fact, David Smith is requesting a private road review of a portion of Cunner Lane to amend, replace a 1997 public access waiver granted by the planning board in which a turnaround was approved for the east side of Cunner Lane. The applicant would like to relocate the turnaround through approval of a private road which requires review under section 19-7-9. 
two, the planning board granted a private access waiver for a lot located at 19 Cunner Lane on February 18th, 1997, and the town adopted a new zoning ordinance in May of 1997. The new zoning ordinance revised the public access waiver provisions into a private access way permit that may only be issued for access to one lot. The planning board finds that the portions of the public access waiver not revised remains in effect and the revisions will be reviewed as required in the current zoning ordinance. The relocated turnaround is located on a driveway that provides access to two lots. Is that really correct? Yes. Okay. Which are you, the access to they, two lots? The access to two lots. Yes, it does. Okay. Because I, okay. So the private road standard will be applied to the proposed amendments. The planning board finds that the portion of Cunner Lane located between the original turnaround and the proposed right of way of, of the Cunner Lane private road depicted on plan submitted September 25th, 2019 is equivalent in road condition to the public access waiver granted in 1997. The applicant and abutters are involved in ongoing litigation regarding Cunner Lane this planning board review is limited to the proposed private road Cunner, Cunner Lane as shown in, on the plans dated September 25th, 2019 and does not address existing or pending rights that may exist in the existing Cunner Lane. The planning board held a site visit on Cunner Lane on Tuesday, October 1st, 2019 at 6 p.m. The private road will not result in undue water pollution. The private road is not located in the 100-year floodplain. Soils will support the private road. The slope of the land, proximity to streams, and state and local water resource rules and regulations will not be compromised by the private road. The private road will not cause soil erosion based on the erosion control plan provided. The private road will not cause unreasonable road congestion or unsafe vehicular and pedestrian traffic. The private road provides for road network connectivity for two lots while discouraging through traffic. The private road is laid out to conform it to existing topography as much as is feasible. The private road is designed to meet town standards with the exception of waivers granted from locating the road in the center of the right of way, from providing a road width of 10 foot pavers plus two, two foot loamed and gravel base shoulders for a total of 14 feet instead of 22 feet, and from installing an enclosed drainage system. The private road will not have an undue adverse impact on scenic or natural areas, historic sites, significant wildlife habitat, rare natural areas, or public access to the shoreline. The private road is compatible with applicable provisions of the comprehensive plan and town ordinances. The applicant has demonstrated adequate technical and financial capability to complete the project. The private road will not adversely impact the quality or quantity of groundwater. The private road is not located in the floodplain. The private road will provide for adequate stormwater management. The applicant has substantially addressed the standards of 19-7-9 private road review. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of David Smith for a private road review of a portion of Connor Lane to amend replace a 1997 public access waiver granted by the planning board to relocate the turnaround be approved subject to the following conditions. That waivers are granted to allow Connor Lane not to be centered in the proposed right of way to reduce a road width from 22 feet to 10 foot wide pavers plus a two foot wide loamed and seeded gravel shoulder on each side of the road for a total of 14 feet and to not require an enclosed drainage system. That a note be added to the plan that there shall be no alteration of the site until a performance guarantee has been provided to the town in accordance with section 16-2-6 of the subdivision ordinance. 
and that the plans be revised and submitted to the town planner for review and approval prior to recording the private road plan. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Okay, next item on the agenda. Cottage Brook buffering amendments. Joel Fitzpatrick of Cottage Brook LLC is requesting amendments to the previously approved Cottage Brook subdivision to restore plantings within the buffer and install an approved trail in the Cottage Brook condominium located off Astor Lane, section 1625, amendment to, amendment to a previously approved subdivision. This is a hearing for completeness, uh, followed by a public hearing. Peter Curry is recusing himself from this uh, item. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Uh, my name is Henry Hess with Sebago Technics, uh, registered Maine landscape architect, and I'm here to represent Mr. Joel Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick Associates at Cottage Brook Condominiums. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity for this discussion tonight, as well as uh, discussing the amended site plan and planting plan here. Uh, given the fact that it's already past eight, we'll try and keep this a little brief. Um, uh, in front of you is the packet uh, with some descriptions of some of the plants of the amended planting plan here for Cottage Brook condominiums. Uh, there are two areas in the Cottage Brook condominiums uh, property that have been cited as being accidentally cleared beyond the approved limit of the proposed clearing line. Um, and to that, the planting plan here up on the board, as well as some of the information in your packet, is proposing that a robust planting of native trees and shrubs, as well as naturalized shrubs, uh, are to be planted. And in the south section of the Glos Way, it is meant to be a one-to-one -one ratio of stumps that were out and located. So a one-to-one -one ratio of stumps that were cut to trees being replaced, as well as over to the east of Headland Way to replace uh, within, the, uh, within the town buffer here, as well as to buffer the trail to the east side of the Headland Way. Uh, this planting proposes a mix of white pine, Austrian pine, weeping willow, uh, clethra or summer sweet, as well as magnolia, which is a change from the workshop which was submitted in the application there. Uh, the mixture of two of the pines creates a little bit of diversity there within that woodland buffer, uh, and that diversity can help strengthen some of the forests there as well as the woodland buffer itself. The pines create that evergreen year-round interest they create a dense screening uh, for a visual buffer. Uh, the willows themselves are a very large tree. Those trees can create a six, you know, 50 to 60 feet high with a quite a wide canopy as well. Uh, not only wide, but also they go from the top to the bottom. They don't tend to have that large trunk section. They tend to be wide and spreading. Also creates a great uh, buffer, as well as a visual barrier in between the properties. The magnolia tree itself also provides some interest in white flowers uh, and is very hardy to the area, is a vigorous grower. Uh, and also the clethra ulnifolia, the summer sweet, is the understory shrub that can provide some of that 
uh, second tier layering beneath the canopies of some of the trees as they get older. So you'll have that once the trees grow up and they have uh, a higher canopy, the lower shrubs of the plethora will fill up to that eight, to foot, eight foot high uh, canopy line. So you'll still have that lower understory level. The goal of this planting plan here is to create that year-round interest, having the flowers as well as the evergreen screen and fall color as well with the weeping willow and the magnolia. Um, it's, in, it's proposed to be installed at robust sizes to help with the initial screening uh, and over the course of five to ten years should fill in and blend in well with the uh, native woodland edge. Uh, we're hoping that the board would, uh, we're looking for approval of this plan so that the buffer can be revegetated and the trail can be buffered as soon as possible this year. Um, board has any other questions? Or if I've left anything out, Joel, you're welcome to jump in. If board has any other questions, uh, we appreciate your time tonight. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna open the meeting to a public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on this issue? Okay, seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. Board members, do you have any questions or comments? And this is um, a hearing for completeness. No. Regarding completeness, I, I think we definitely have all the information we need to, to move forward. Um, I have no issue as far as completeness is concerned. John? I have a motion. Go ahead. Um, motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Fitzpatrick Associates for amendments to the previously approved Cottage Brook condominiums located off Astor Lane to replant buffer areas that were altered in error be deemed complete. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. The motion passes. Okay, um, does anyone have any comments or questions of the substantive nature? John? I just have one question, it's for Maureen, um, just whether or not the tree warden was uh, spoken to with regards to the, the plan, the I types never, of trees. I never, re I may have requested comments from the tree warden, I have never received anything from him. Okay, but in no concerns from the types of plantings that are being proposed here? I haven't heard from him. I'm, I'm very familiar, I mean, for what it's worth, I'm familiar with the plantings. Um, everything Mr. Hass has said is, it lines up with my knowledge. I actually have a magnolia and clethra on my property and can attest to exactly what he described for how they grow. Thank you. I have one question slash comment, if I may. Um, living up the street from that, I know that there is, and I'm struggling a little bit to figure out where this is on here, but you know, I walk down, I live on Astor Lane, so I walk down it a lot, but there's a wetland, it's basically like a, a drainage from that uh, pulls water from the, I guess it's the north, where are we oriented, oriented here? The east side of uh, the Glose Way development, it it's basically runs underneath and then there's like a, an actual, it's actually a little wetland now, it's kind of cool. But I think it kind of dumps out and it's really not, it's not shown here particularly well. It's kind of indicated on this. Um, but it seems like it's kind of around where these plantings are. So I didn't know if that was taken into consideration when you're, figuring out where these should be and what should be there. I just want to make sure that, that, that it was, because obviously that would change. I'd just like to make sure you're talking about this section of the way right through here. Yeah, there's, it's kind of near the tra there, yeah, there's like, uh, it, there's now like a giant wall with a, with a fence, I'm sure Joel knows what I'm talking about. And then just below that, kind of down slope of uh, Gloss Way, there's a little retaining wetland. Um, um, I, yeah, I am, I am familiar with what you're discussing there. I have been to the site and I have seen that it does tend to get uh, a little wet in that region. Yeah. Um, the willow trees, as well as the uh, clethra are all quite adapt yeah. to more saturated soils from time to time. 
uh, so they should do quite fine when, if, if there's a, a storm event and there is some pooling water there, sitting water, it should be just fine. I mean, it, there is wetland vegetation growing there now. So, I mean, it pools water all the time. I'm just more concerned about like, I, I know the, uh, you see willows next to streams, so I'm not really worried. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, well, and even white pines, I guess, can grow on the edge of wetlands. I'm sort of more worried about them not surviving if they're just wet all the time. I, I don't know about the, the, the pine, maybe you can comment on that, but you know, I'm fine with it, just want to make sure that it's been considered. We're not just putting plants on the ground that are gonna not, not survive because um, of the situation there. Uh, certainly, yeah. No, I appreciate the uh, the thought on that, and it, some of that planting has been has been considered, and we'll definitely take, make sure that that's in consideration when planting out the field. Could I? Yeah, Maureen has Just a to comment. Just Mr. Gilbert, that is absolutely a wetland. It was mapped as a wetland when the project came forward and was approved by the planning board, and it was one of the reasons some of the removal of vegetation in there was a little disturbing. So yes, you're absolutely right. It is a wetland. Um, I, I don't know if we want to make if we make findings of fact. If we want to make a note just to say that to, to to give some flexibility to alter either the type of plant or the location. I don't know how we would do that. Um, um, Maureen. Well, th this is a subdivision approval, yeah. and then there there are some provisions in the subdivision or ordinance that allow for some very limited field changes. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel comfortable that small tweaks that are consistent with the planning board's intent are allowed under the current ordinance. I would caution you against putting things in your approval because, frankly, you, you don't want people making changes to uh, your yes. approval in a. In okay, a yeah, that's fine. Yeah, free that's and easy sort of way. In there, then. Also, it's not really in the applicant's interest to put stuff in the ground that's not going to survive. Sure, but if they feel like they want to follow the, what we approved exactly, and then they're, you know, you know what I mean? I mean, yes, I, I would agree that that's, that's the case. I mean, they have a whole back, too, it looks like, for replacing, but um, I just want to make sure that that's been considered and there is a, some flexibility, that's all. Carol Ann. I was just gonna say, if, from what, I, what I'm understanding that Andrew's saying is, if they get out there and they wanna put a willow tree where they now have a magnolia, that it's not a problem, is what I'm understanding. That's right, I mean, they have it on the plant but as such. If yeah. it's, but if they switch out a type of variety of tree, totally, that is a problem. So where they position the trees, I think is open for, like you say, field. I mean, what we, we've always done is if there's a little bit of shifting a couple of feet in one way or another, we consider that a reasonable field change. Also, we have had situations where applicants have proposed a certain type of evergreen and it's not available and they will switch in another same type of evergreen, but we're not gonna let people put in a deciduous tree where they, up, they had originally proposed an evergreen. So we try to hold it as closely as possible to the intent of the planning board while still being reasonable about the realities of how these things go in. And I agree with with Joe. People aren't going to waste money on, on trees that they don't think will grow in their location. All right, are there any other questions about the application? Um, so we should next decide if we need a sidewalk. Does anybody have strong feelings either way? I personally don't. Um, we spent a lot of time on between Cottage Brook and then also um, Maxwell Woods, which is right next door. And so from looking at the maps, I can definitely picture where these are. And um, the proposal is to replant what's been erroneously taken down. Um, I don't, personally, I don't need to see a site walk to, uh, to have that um, weigh in on my decision on, on this, but that's just me. I agree with Jonathan. No, I agree too. I, I run and walk through there, and um, so I, I think it's fine. No okay. site walk required. Yeah, as much as I would like to go there for another site walk, I agree with John that we don't really need one. Preferably when it's not snowing. <laughs> 
Okay. All right. Well, I have a motion for approval. That's not 90 paragraphs long. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Do we need a, we need a public hearing? Uh, motion for approval, findings of fact. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so before we move on, I'm gonna open the meeting to a public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on the matter? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Now I have a motion. Go ahead. All right, uh, findings of fact. Number one, Fitzpatrick Associates is requesting amendments to the previously approved Cottage Brook condominiums located off Astor Lane to replant buffer areas that were altered in error, which requires review under section 16-2-5, amendments to previously approved subdivision plans. Number two, the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board has previously found the Cottage Brook subdivision to be in compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the findings and decisions of those approvals, which are not altered by the proposed amendments remain in effect. Uh, number three, the amendments uh, do restore a vegetative buffer throughout and around the subdivision and screening as needed. Number four, the amendments do restore compliance with the open space impact fee requirement. Number five, the applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Fitzpatrick Associates for amendments to the previously approved Cottage Brook condominiums located off Astor Lane to replant buffer areas that were altered in error be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that south of Headland Way, the pine trees be planted so that the edge of the plantings is a minimum of 10 feet from the edge of the trail surface and the summer sweet is planted so that the edge of the plantings is a minimum of five feet from the edge of the trail surface. And number two, that 10% of the total cost of plantings and installation be reserved for one year from time of planting to be used for replacement if planting things die. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. The motion passes. Okay, other business. Public comment. Is there anyone present who wishes to make any comments? Seeing none, the public comment session is closed. Oh, I just was going to make a motion. When you're ready. Go ahead. A motion we adjourn. Second. <laughs> All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you.